How many times have you been randomly messaged by someone who is legit asking you for sex? It doesn't happen. So if it happens to you, it's fake. That once they have you, once they know that you're the bank, they'll keep coming back. We take complaints from people who've been affected by image-based abuse, adult cyber abuse, child cyber bullying, who are concerned about the presence of child abuse material online. We educate, we work on prevention. Uh, so my background is in law enforcement. I ended up as a detective, but I also did duties as a youth liaison officer. I went into child protection. And then a role came up within the Australian Communications and Media Authority uh, for an online investigator. Uh, I think a good investigator uh, has to be curious, deeply curious. You know, you need to see a problem and go, why is that happening? And both have the desire to understand the solution or the answer, but the skills to be able to obtain the information that allows you to connect the dots. So image-based abuse uh, predominantly affects women. Uh, so about one in five women aged 18 to 45 have told us that they've experienced some form of image-based abuse. And that typically takes the form of someone who comes into possession of an intimate image or, or a video, um, posting that online or sharing it amongst a circle of friends. So if the recipient of the image then forwards that on to someone else without the consent of the person who sent it, that's image-based abuse. Sexting someone is not wrong, no treatment of that image by the person who receives it is the key test as to whether or not something has been done that's right or wrong. So we moved away from calling uh, this kind of abuse revenge porn because we asked the question, well, revenge for what? I mean, revenge suggests that there's some legitimate basis for exacting, you know, a, like kind of compensation from somebody. But when you think about the kind of classic image-based abuse scenario, which is, um, it's um, you know, an aggrieved partner at the end of a relationship sharing intimate material without the consent of the other person. That's not actually a legitimate form of expression of hurt or confusion or um, disappointment at all. Pornography also requires a degree of consent. If there's no consent in a uh, pornographic image or a pornographic video, then it's not pornography. So an example of how image-based abuse could occur um, can be explained in an example that relates to a complaint that we got from a woman in her 20s. Uh, she had some videos that were stored in cloud storage uh, folder. Uh, and somehow, even though that was encrypted and it was protected by a password, someone got access to it. And so you can imagine the hurt and the shock and the fear of learning that these videos, which were never intended to be seen by the public at all, found their way to one of the largest and most popular adult porn sites on the internet. We were um, in contact with a man who, an Australian man, who told us that his ex-partner had recorded them having sex without his knowledge. Uh, and he'd uploaded some of this footage to OnlyFans uh, without the remotest knowledge of the victim, his former, his former partner. We worked with him and worked with OnlyFans as well, who you know, took pretty swift action uh, to have the material removed from OnlyFans, but it was posted again. His former partner had been charged by New South Wales Police and was convicted. Victims feel a profound sense of violation, uh, particularly when there's a connection between the image-based abuse in a relationship, the person who you trusted and you thought uh, cared for you and loved you, even though the relationship might have ended, has taken step of, in some cases, like monetizing the content. What's in it for the perpetrator is often uh, power. What we've seen shift in the last 18 to 24 months is a move to a set of complaints that focus on sexual extortion. 
So sexual extortion is a kind of blackmail that involves uh, a perpetrator um, contacting a victim, obtaining from that victim intimate material, and then threatening to share it more widely if, in most cases, uh, a monetary amount's not paid. The interesting thing is actually how consistent the methodology is. The crooks have latched onto a methodology that, that works. And you don't have to, as a crook, succeed with every interaction. You only need to succeed one in a hundred or two hundred or five hundred times for it to be worth your while because the amount of investment that you need to make in creating fake accounts, it's actually fairly cost efficient to run this as, a, as an enterprise. And in fact, we've got uh, evidence that shows that uh, between victims who've come to us for help, uh, they're being approached by perpetrators who are using exactly the same scripts. Right, I'll, I'll get a message from uh, an account that I don't know that's new, that wants to connect, uh, and the profile pic will be of an attractive young woman about my age. They might be looking at what I'm posting, they might be looking at uh, what I'm liking. So it feels almost instantly that you've developed a relationship with this person, that you've got an affinity, and that conversation will develop. Sometimes it takes days, it could take weeks for that conversation to get to a point where uh, the perpetrator asks me to uh, add them to my Snapchat, and then on Snapchat, uh, they'll send me an image. They'll have taken it from the internet, right? So it's not actually of a person associated with this uh, form of blackmail. They'll have cropped it in a way, or presented it in a way, to make it look as much as possible, uh, aligned with the profile picture. So I might post an image of my genitals, I might post an image of myself masturbating, and that's the hook. So that's the snare. And as soon as that image or that video is sent, the veil drops and the scam's revealed. Uh, and the perpetrator will say, you know, we've got you, uh, if you don't want this shared with your friends and family, your whole social network, because I can see that you regularly post to, you know, account, 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 you know, they might have even, even done some profiling of you and they might know who your mum is, they might know who your sister is, they might know who your employer is and they'll say now you need to provide us with the value that we require. The thing that really causes me great concern is the fact that we've seen cases where um, young people have suicided as a result of these threats. Uh, it's tragic, it's heartbreaking. I was talking to a law enforcement colleague of mine uh, at the end of last year and he said that the advice that he gives and this is what he says to parents he says parents what you should be saying to your young people is this this happens at one o'clock in the morning two o'clock in the morning walk down the hall and wake us up because there is nothing that we can't solve together you don't have to bear this alone and i think that's such important advice because it feels at that moment that the world has ended and it hasn't so the best tactics that we've seen from young people who get that is, you know, these young guys, 18, 19, 20 years old, go, ah, oh, shit, <laughs> this, this has happened. The best thing I can do now is tell everybody. So they've posted to their social media, for example, they've posted to Instagram, they've posted to all of their friends and family that uh, they might get an image or a video in their inbox from this perpetrator. And if that happens, sorry, super embarrassing, don't open it, but that then ceases any hold uh, or control that the perpetrator has on you. You actually just completely neutralized their power. There's also help that we can provide too in terms of providing advice and some guidance about how to engage with the platforms to, because the platforms will, in almost all cases, provide assistance here. They need to keep organized crime off their platforms. Um, and so they've got some pretty clear policies that help. Some of what holds victims back from from reporting. I, I think people feel silly, I think they feel fearful because they may uh, be in a situation where disclosing to parents or carers could put them at risk. Uh, I think they feel embarrassed and humiliated. The embarrassment that you might feel or the shame that you might feel is transitory compared with the power that you get back from 
engaging someone who can help. But the thing to remember is that once they have you, once they know that you're the bank, they'll keep coming back. Uh, and so our advice always is never engage. Okay, fake interaction can be spotted by applying the, if it's too good to be true, then it probably is test. I mean, <laughs> how many times have you been randomly messaged by someone who is legit asking you for sex? It doesn't happen. So if it happens to you, it's fake, right? And if that's the case, even if there's a risk of it not being true, don't engage. But you, there are other tells as well. So if you take the profile picture and then run it through Google reverse image search, you, you'll probably get a hit because it's probably been drawn from some other, other site. Have a look at the image and uh, see if there's any background detail. If there's no background detail and it's just a head, then it's probably the product of generative AI. Generative AI, uh, when it comes to creating like portrait style figures, does a great job of the face, does a really bad job of the background, does a really bad job of like earrings and that sort of thing too. And then look at the kind of text as well that accompanies it. If it sounds like a script, it is a script and we know that they tend to originate from like, the Philippines, from West Africa. You know, this is a global enterprise and you're not the only victim. There are thousands around the world every day. Adult cyber abuse is a, a new form of harm, material that targets a specific Australian adult that is intended to cause them serious harm and is offensive, harassing, or threatening. So when it comes to cyber abuse, about 60% of all of the complaints that we receive are from women. The most serious kinds of abuse that we see that reach that really high threshold uh, are things like uh, doxing, with a um, encouragement to uh, do the target of the doxing harm. So we've seen that where, uh, for example, someone who was part of a you know, political community online falls out of favour with that community. Uh, it's a community of you know, violent extremists and their details, their home address, where they work, uh, details of their family, where they live and where they work, posted online with an explicit call to do them violence. That's adult cyber abuse. Targets have been encouraged to kill themselves with extremely explicit instructions uh, and that being repeated over and over and over again by the same account that's adult cyber abuse. And so what drives perpetrators is malice. Uh, you don't set out to cause someone harm, serious harm, and we're not talking just simple fear and distress or anger because those kinds of emotional responses uh, fall below the threshold. You've got to set out to cause someone serious fear for their own safety. You've got to set out to cause someone serious physical injury, serious physical harm. The abuse of adults uh, as it's recognised by the Online Safety Act and the cyberbullying of children are both deemed equally serious. And the reason the cyberbullying scheme is pitched at a lower level of uh, proof for us in terms of those threshold questions is because it recognises that children are far more vulnerable. I think everybody who works with child exploitation material, child abuse material, remembers the first time that they saw the worst content. Uh, I certainly do, and it was something that affected me for a long time and continues to affect me still in the sense that it gives you an understanding of just how difficult it can be for some children in these abusive relationships where their abuse is being recorded by perpetrators and shared within communities at scale. And the abuse is worse than anything you can imagine. Uh, and it's only when you really see it laid bare that you realise the, you know, the depths of cruelty that adults are capable of. And so in recognition of that, you know, we do a lot of uh, staff welfare. You know, I, I often say to our teams that the reason uh, the oxygen mask on a plane is first to be attached to yourself is so that you can help the other people around you. So I, I never lose faith in humanity. In fact, the most inspiring 
people I've ever met work in this area. I kind of get kind of emotional thinking about it actually because it means so much to Australians uh, and the fact that we can work within that environment and actually deliver outcomes for thousands and thousands of people is amazing. The internet provides a strong disinhibiting effect uh, on all of us because of the distance between ourselves and those with whom we're in conversation. When we layer on uh, anonymizing um, technologies, uh, when we layer on the ability to use pseudonyms and veil our identity, then that creates even more distance. And I think for a lot of people that gives a sense that they now have permission to engage in behaviour that they would never face to face. Sometimes we hear people um, say that uh, victims should just get off social media, right? but that's just not realistic. The internet is totally enmeshed in all of our lives, it doesn't matter what age you are, what you do for a living, uh, but when you look at the way it's transformed education, communications, gaming, the professional domains. So the idea that you can just push that away and disconnect and be safe is just wrong. Because the other thing too is that the abuse doesn't stop there. Those who are at risk of say physical harm through abuse online won't be made safe by removing themselves from the online world. And why should their voices be silenced? That's not fair uh, and it's not reasonable. And so we need to promote people's voices. We need to promote people's sense of safety and trust online. And so we've all got a responsibility, not only to conduct ourselves more humanely online, but call out bad behavior when we see it and encourage uh, the companies who provide these services to continue to do better. An adult who's the target of online abuse has a, a range of options. So part of the reporting schemes uh, that we look after when it comes to cyberbullying and adult cyber abuse require the complainant first to have made a complaint to the social media service. It's really important. The social media service has the primary responsibility for dealing with the abuse that uh, a person might be targeted with. If they fail to take action, then that's when our role comes in. Use the reporting options that are abundantly provided for within a whole range of services. Learn to use the conversation control tools as well. You know, mute, block. If you're using Instagram, for example, there is a very fine degree of control you can have over the way messages come into your inbox, uh, the kind of language that you want to exclude from those messages too. So get to know those tools. They're becoming more extensive, more sophisticated, um, and that's where that first sense of regaining control can come from. But report to the service, absolutely. First thing to remember is that it's not your fault. You haven't done anything wrong. Um, that sense of shame and that sense of having been stupid or, or, or done something that no one else would do is sometimes uh, a barrier to reporting. And so victims suffer in this sort of self-imposed isolation, which is really heartbreaking. Remember that if something like this has happened to you, it's happened to thousands of other people as well. And there's no shame in it. Coming forward, that's the first step to regaining control and a sense of agency and power over what's happened. Because you've got the power, right? Not the perpetrator. We haven't been able to predict over the last seven years or so where harms were evolving to. And so looking to the future, uh, we need to be ready for the impact of generative AI. Uh, we need to be ready for the impact of the metaverse, uh, for example, on uh, how harms and crimes can be committed. We're talking to our police colleagues about this all the time. It's fascinating. Uh, and so thinking about what's coming down the highway to us now, you know, the horizons are growing shorter and shorter and shorter. These aren't distant technologies, but ones which have already arrived on our doorstep. Um, we need to be agile and creative and we need to embrace change uh, as part of our, our functions.